His pointillistic style of tone-color melody paved the way for an entire generation of composers to come. I'm the Classical Nerd, and today we're talking about Anton Webern. Webern was born in Austria in December 1883 into a family that had been noble since the late 1500s. His name, thus at birth, was Anton von Webern, but as we'll soon come to find out, referring to him with the nobility particle von isn't wrong, but it isn't entirely accurate either. His mother was a singer and a pianist, and she and Anton were very close. His father was a mining engineer who managed to work his way to the top to become chief of mining for the Habsburgs. Young Anton learned the cello and performed locally, and his first compositions, dating from when he was in the middle of his teenage years, often include his own instrument. Webern began going to the University of Vienna in 1902, and while there studied composition and musicology. His doctoral dissertation was on a set of nearly 400 Renaissance motets, which belies his deep and abiding interest in early music. While a student at the university, he made the acquaintance of Arnold Schoenberg, from whom he took composition lessons beginning in 1904. Along with his teacher and his fellow pupil Alban Berg, they formed what would become known as the core group of the Second Viennese School, which would introduce a systematized approach to composition without solid key centers. Webern idolized Schoenberg in many respects, and for Schoenberg, Webern was one of his first actual compositional pupils. Schoenberg would later say that Webern learned as much from him as he did from Webern. In the years following his graduation, he began taking various posts as a conductor. Despite his total lack of training in the field, he was surprisingly good at it, if remarkably fickle. He tended to move to follow Schoenberg around, and then he would just get whatever conducting gig or gigs were in the local area. Webern married in 1911, but at first the marriage was somewhat legally compromised because it was to his cousin, and the Catholic Church wasn't a huge fan of that. It was also a shotgun wedding because she was heavily pregnant at the time. By the time the church approved of their relationship, four years in, they already had three kids. He briefly served in the German army during World War I, but was discharged due to bad eyesight, all the while imploring the powers that were to spare Schoenberg from active service. Schoenberg was, despite his efforts, drafted anyway, and Webern did what he could to help get his mentor out. Webern, like a lot of German composers, believed that Germanic music was superior to all other kinds of music, and that other non-German composers were only great insofar as they copied great German composers. He was deeply committed to the things that he loved, and the things that he loved included his family, specifically his mother, the German people, his mentor Schoenberg, and nature. His love for his mother meant that after her death he wrote to Berg and said that all of his pieces that he'd written after her death were about her death. In 1919, the Austrian government passed a law called the Adelshofhebungsgesetz. I think I'm saying that right. Anyway, this was a law that abolished the nobility formally, and so after this he dropped the fawn from his name. It was also in this time that he helped in the organization of a group called the Society for Private Musical Performances, which was run mostly by members of the Second Viennese School and those who were sympathetic to their experimentation as a safe space for their performances, free from the cackles and jeers of the public. They were very successful at the promotion of modernist music to interested parties, but it came to a halt when hyperinflation began to rack the German-speaking world. When that struck in the 1920s, Webern was as hard hit as anyone else. His main day-to-day -day work was in conducting various orchestras and choirs. Even though he hated it, it was musical and he did get some income out of it. Still, whenever possible, he moved to follow Schoenberg around. When Schoenberg invented the 12-tone technique in 1924, Webern was hot on his heels, and he adopted the system for his own use. He created music of extreme registral shifts, pointillistic textures, and copious silences between gestures. Webern's use of the technique became such a fundamental part of his language that some have seen the system as a co-invention between himself and his teacher. Though it's impossible to exactly quantify, the amount of ink put to paper in the service of Webern analysis probably far outpaces that of even his mentor Schoenberg. Webern may very well be the most analyzed composer of all time, especially when you compare it to the number of works he produced, which isn't big by any stretch of the imagination. Webern idolized Schoenberg's 12-tone technique as much as he idolized Schoenberg, and he distilled the technique down to its very core. 
He refined it to such a degree that Schoenberg thought them equals in pioneering a new path for composers. They both made a habit to go back to forms of the past and use those forms as a reference point for harmonic languages that didn't contain traditionally tonal chords or tonal points of reference. This can be seen all the way back in Webern's Opus 1 Passacaglia, which doesn't bear a whole lot of resemblance to his later works, but does belie his love of old forms. Just as Schoenberg had used Baroque forms and numerology to structure his landmark atonal melodrama Piero Lunaire, so too was Webern a fan of using references to past works. And he was not above referencing even things from the Renaissance or Middle Ages. Webern's music is characterized by brevity and pointillism. He once said that he felt as if a piece was finished once he'd found a way to play all 12 tones. Instead of using the 12-tone technique as a jumping-off point, or something like structural mileposts, he used it as a structure in and of itself. His pieces were short enough for him to get away with it. His longest piece barely cracks 10 minutes, and on the other extreme, the fourth of his opus 10 five pieces for orchestra, that's barely 20 seconds, if that. When the composer and conductor Pierre Boulez recorded the complete Webern works years later, it fit onto just a handful of CDs, half of which were works that predated the Opus 1 Passacaglia that really starts his formal career. While these early works, which were lost until the 1960s, do not really foreshadow the uncompromising brand of atonality he would come to pioneer, they are an interesting part of his collected works. Many of these early pieces were songs because he held a lifelong fascination with the human voice, like many composers, actually. He also pioneered something called Klangfarben Melody, or Tone Color Melody, where a given line would be split up between a ton of different instruments in an orchestral texture. Every note or two, the color would change. This dovetailed well with his love of extremely sparse textures, where every note is meticulously crafted and orchestrated and clear. This technique wouldn't be limited to instruments in the same register. No, he'd end up skipping way around registers. There was even an interrelationship between notes and tone colors, so that the series of timbres had some formal relationship to their pitches. This distinct flavor of orchestration was even well received in his orchestrations of more traditional works of other composers. As the 1920s gave way to the 1930s, fascism was on the loose. Austria had to contend with their own version of fascist ideology throughout the early 1930s, and then came their annexation by Nazi Germany. After this, referred to as the Anschluss, Austrian artists were thrust under the dictatorial baton of National Socialism, and Webern was no exception. Art that was modern and or created by someone of Jewish heritage, and or created by someone who just knew too many people of Jewish heritage, and or that Hitler just didn't personally like, it was all under the same banner, Entate de Kunst, or Degenerate Art. While this had its roots in the censorship of visual art, music was not immune. Printing Webern's music became illegal, and performing it entirely out of the question. Webern and several other non-Jewish composers were attacked in the press for supposedly Jewish heritage and influence, and Webern saw his income shrink to nothing. He had to take on laborious grunt work for his editor as a copyist and as an occasional transcriber of operas down to piano vocal scores. Schoenberg had fled for his life and ended up in Los Angeles, but Webern chose to stay behind. There is some degree of controversy about what Webern actually thought of Nazism, which is kind of crazy considering what happened to him under their regime. He tended to view the movement as much more multifaceted than it really was. He didn't think that the movement had a coherence of ideology, when in fact it really did. He was torn because on one hand he agreed with the Nazis that the German people were superior, and he felt grateful that they had managed to claw the German-speaking world out of the hyperinflation, the massive amount of it that rivals that of modern-day Venezuela. He was not consistently pro-Nazi, and different accounts paint different pictures of how he actually felt towards the regime. Much of his views at any particular time can be best explained by what was politically the most expedient. In many instances, one can make the argument that his pro-Nazism was simply him covering his tracks in case the Gestapo ever came snooping. He expressed some outwardly anti-Semitic comments and views while helping Jewish friends and colleagues. He held a position at a school for blind Jewish kids in the latter half of the 1920s, 
And not to mention that he just adored his teacher Schoenberg, who was Jewish by heritage, and that's one of the reasons he fled the country. There's actually compelling evidence on both sides. But if actions do speak louder than words, you'd be hard-pressed to actually call him a Nazi. Webern's son Peter was killed in an Allied air raid in 1945, and Webern himself was drafted into the air raid police as the regime became more and more desperate for bodies. On the night of September 15, 1945, in Allied-occupied Austria, Webern stepped outside of his home to enjoy a cigar. His son-in-law, Benno Mattel, was a former SS member who was also active in the black market, and Allied troops were in the area conducting a sting operation. A trigger-happy private from North Carolina saw the glow of Webern's cigar and shot three bullets in his direction. One of these hit its mark, and Webern was dead at the age of 65. When the private, a cook, realized what he'd done, he became so distraught that he turned to alcoholism, and he had drunk himself to death within the decade. Moral of the story? Don't smoke, I, I guess. Make it shot. Oh, what, too soon? Webern was interested in order and symmetry, and would construct tone rows for his pieces which were internally symmetrical. That is, the intervals on one side of the row would be equivalent to the intervals on the other side, and so on. This also led to his use of symmetrical structures across the length of entire pieces, leading to a unity of expression he sought. He also began the process of applying 12-tone procedures to parts of music other than pitch. This thus led the groundwork for 20th century serialism, which sought to apply the techniques of the Second Viennese School to every single possible aspect of music. His music can also be very visually striking, sometimes including non-audible elements that help analysts figure out exactly what he's doing with the rows. These can serve as helpful analytical easter eggs. Yet, during his lifetime he was considered the oddball and the least understandable of any member of the Second Viennese School. He only acquired his status as a visionary, as the unassailable patron saint of serialism in the 1950s. In a West where access to music was unrestricted, and composers felt like they had to seek out the compositional ideology that existed furthest from the conservative socialist realism. All the serialists loved Webern and credited him as the starting point for their own musical styles, and they sought to imbue their music with as much abstraction and as much inner mathematical logic as possible, sometimes to the detriment of what the pieces ended up sounding like. And Webern's scores are indeed a goldmine for their craft and their deep understanding of 12-tone procedures. I'll say myself that studying a Webern score is about as much fun as you can have with sheet music and a calculator. In a post-war musical world trying its best to distance itself from subjectivity and expression, the objectivity of Webern's music became the natural starting point. His strange and sudden death also made him a bit of a martyr figure for the serialists, him having been cut down before he could say all that he had to say. And indeed, it was his approach to Schoenberg's technique that made him an uncompromising cornerstone in the equally uncompromising decades to come. Thank you.